السلام عليكم ورحمه الله هذا الشيخ بارك الله في حياته الله يخليه ويحفظك الله يبارك الله يبارك اسم الحبيب ايمن الله يبارك فيك خلك الجنه يا رب العالمين بارك الله واسم الكريم زهين الله يجعلهم زين العابدين يا رب العالمين ما شاء الله ما شاء الله ما شاء الله عليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله How you doing إن شاء الله عبد What's your name محمد ما شاء الله Good to see you الحمد لله Thank you Thank you brother I appreciate that That's so good الحمد لله I hope so إن شاء الله حبيب كيف حالك ما شاء الله كيف حالك؟ عماد الدين اند محمود عماد الدين محمود واخيرا نور 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 يعني لايت نور الله ينور عليك وات يور نيم محمد ما شاء الله اوكي بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم فهمنا عنك فإنا لا نفهم عنك إلا بك ربي إني أسألك علما نافعا وقلبا خاشعا ولسانا ذاكرا وعينا دامعا ودعاء مستجابا وتوبة نصوحا Before we begin my dear brothers and sisters I want us to clarify our intentions uh, When I was studying in the university every class we began with so if I ask all of you please to repeat after me just to clarify our niyyah inshallah. So uh, we'll do in Arabic and we'll translate. So in Arabic, Allahumma inni nawaitu at-ta'alluma wa-ta'lim wa-naf'a wa-intifa' wa-tadhakura wa-tadhkir wa-l-ifadata wa-l-istifada wa-l-hatha على التمسك بكتاب الله وسنة رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم والدعاء إلى الهدى والدلالة على الخير ابتغاء وجه الله تعالى ومرضاته وثوابه وقربه So we translate to Oh Allah, I make an intention to learn and to teach. Because whatever you learn here today, you have responsibility to pass this knowledge. Knowledge has to be shared, right? Then, التذكرة والتذكير الإفادة والاستفادة We have to make dua for knowledge that will benefit. علم ينتفع به Meaning, it's not important how many people were in the cave, أصحاب الكهف. سيقولون ثلاثة رابعهم كلبهم خمسة سادس This is not knowledge that will benefit you. It's not important to know the small details that do not benefit. The importance is to get the انتفاع, benefit, right? والتذكير Meaning to remind myself of Allah and to remind others of Allah. I will tell you something. My teacher, he asked the question, How do you know if somebody is a person of Allah? How do you know? And we thought about it, and we thought about it. If you want to know somebody is Ahlullah, people of Allah, there are people, when you are with them, they remind you of who? Allah. Simple. You're with them, they remind you of Allah. وَالتَّذَكُّرَ وَالتَّذْكِيرِ And we mentioned ifada and istifada. وَالْحَثَّ عَلَى التَّمَسُّكِ بِكِتَابِ اللَّهِ We all come here to make the intention to get closer to Allah, to hold on to His book. 
to be close to the sunnah. And so it's very important before we begin anything to make intentions. And every class, when we were studying at Zaytuna, before every class, 30 seconds, 30 seconds, that's all it takes. Clarify the niyyah. Why am I here? Why am I here? The first hadith in all of the Imam Nawis, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مْرِئٍ مَا نَوَى فَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ There was a man, he came to Medina because he wanted to get married. And so the Sahaba, they came to Rasulullah, this man, he, he came here to get married. He did not come for you, Ya Rasulullah. وَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ لِدُنْيَا يُصِيبُهَا أَوْ مُرَأَةٍ يَنْكِحُهَا فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى مَا هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِ You will receive why you came here, right? And there's a hadith before we begin. مَا جْتَمَعَ قَوْمٌ فِي بَيْتِ مِنْ بُيُوتِ اللَّهِ يَتْلُونَ كِتَابَ اللَّهِ يَتَدَارَسُونَهُ إِلَّا نَزَلَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ السَّكِينَةُ وَالرَّحْمَةُ حَفَّتْهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَذَكَرَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي مَنْ عِنْدَهُ That there is no gathering in the mosque, house of Allah. This is whose house? This is Allah's house. Who invited you here? Allah did. So if you came here, you came here because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala invited you. And when we go to Mecca, when we go to Medina, we go because who? Because Allah Azza wa Jal invited us. And so we are in Allah's house. And Allah says, We are from a group of people. The angels will say, What about so and so? He came because his mom forced him. Or he came because, I don't know, he wanted to play with his friends. You know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say? All of them will be forgiven. Four things happen. Rahma, mercy, sakina, tranquility, malaika, angels, and Allah will mention you. So with these strong intentions, let us begin our journey, inshallah. Before we begin talking about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and I like to keep everyone interacting, how many prophets are mentioned in the Qur'an? How many? 25. Thank you, sister. Now let's start with the first one. Which is the first prophet? Adam alayhi salam. He's a prophet. Adam alayhi salam. He was mentioned, how many times can you guess in the Qur'an? Qissat Adam wa Iblis. How many times is it mentioned in the Qur'an? Anyone want to take a guess? How many times? Close. Cut that in half. Seven times. It's mentioned in the Qur'an. Seven times. Who is the next prophet? I want to go in order. So who is the next prophet mentioned in the Qur'an? By the way, in the Torah, there's 43 prophets. The Torah and the Injil. So let, before we begin talking about the Qur'an, there's the Old Testament the New Testament, and then the best and most updated testament. The Old Testament is what? The Torah. The Torah was sent to Musa. The New Testament is what? Injil. The Injil was sent to Jesus, which is gospel, good news, Isa. Then the final testament, the Quran, is sent to who? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And if you take the Bible, which when they say Bible, they're talking about two books. They're talking about the Torah and the Injil. Those two books... 36,000 verses. Some say 31, but 30,000 plus ayahs. How many ayahs in the Quran? Anyone want to take a guess? Around how much? Yes. Around 6,000. Good job. You're going to say the same thing. So look, it's a condensed summary. It's a summary of all these books. The Quran, the final testament. You know how we have iPhone 14, 15? The Quran is the most updated, most updated version. The Torah is old version. It needs updating because they changed it. So it's outdated. Injil, outdated. The Quran, the most updated version. So if you're a Muslim, congratulations. You have the highest upgrade, the iOS top. Right now you're at the top, alhamdulillah. So we mentioned Prophet Adam alayhi salam. Who comes after Prophet Adam in the Quran? Anyone want to take a guess? This is a hard one. Yes. Close, but not, not enough. Yes. Idris, Tadbir. Allah was, I did not think anyone would get that. Bonus points if you know his name in English. Because... He is not Idris in English. Idris is his Arabic name. But what is his English name? Because if you Google him in English, you'll find where he's mentioned. The name is Enoch. Enoch. If you look that up in the book of Enoch, Idris. Allahu A'la. Okay, who comes after Idris? So Idris, he develops the pen from Darasa, Yadrusu, knowledge. Who comes after Idris? Nuh alayhi salam. When Nuh came, the, in the world is flooded. There's a new world. Then who comes after Nuh? So far we have three. We, we said 25. We're going to go through all. What is number four? Hud. Very good. MashaAllah. We're getting close to Ibrahim. We're not there yet. There's two more prophets before Ibrahim. He mentioned Hud. Now there's two more. Who are they? Oh, you're, you, we're not at Musa yet. That comes later. He mentioned, I heard it. 
Lut and Saleh. Both so Hud, Lut, Saleh. And Lut actually exists after Saleh because Lut is the nephew of Prophet who? Ibrahim alayhi salam. They're simultaneous. And you know, for the youth, inshallah, next time I'll do the Prophet Ibrahim story. One of the best stories. Ibrahim Khalilul Rahman, he's one of the best stories, but inshallah when the season comes. So now we have Prophet Adam, Idris, Nuh, Hud, Salih, Walut. And we said Ibrahim, who are the two children of Ibrahim now? Ismail wa Ishaq. This is where the split happened. Now be very aware of this. Ismail, he went where? To Mecca. His father left him in Mecca. Ishaq, it comes from which, which mother? Can anyone guess? So Ismail comes from Hajar. She, he comes from Sarah or Sarah, right? She could not have children until in the 80s, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed her with a child, Ishaq. Isaac, the Jews, they believe Ishaq was the one that Ibrahim alayhi salam was going to slaughter. We believe it's Ismail. So the Jews, they were waiting for a prophet from, from who? From Nasr Ishaq. But where did Prophet Muhammad come? From Nasr Ismail. Let's continue. After Ismail, after Ishaq, who comes after? Ya'qub, Jacob, Ya'qub. And Ya'qub has many children. Who is the prophet that he gives birth, uh, uh, who he has? Yusuf, mashallah. After Yusuf, who do you have? Who is his father-in-law of, of, uh, of Musa. Who, who, who comes with Yusuf after? Shu'aib, mashallah. Then after Shu'aib, who do we have? It, 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 should be, it should be Musa, but we have Ayyub and Dhul Kifl before. Then Musa. Because Musa, alayhi salam, when he's... You know, obviously, we all know the beautiful story of Musa. There's Ulul Azmi, min al Rusul. He's one of the Ulul Azmi, meaning one of the elite prophets. Of course, la nufarriqu bayna ahadin. Walakin Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, tilka al Rusulu faddalna ba'dahum ala ba'd. We cannot say this prophet is better than this one. Only Allah can say that. All the prophets, la nufarriqu. They're equal to us. Okay. After Ayyub, after um, you, yeah, uh, Ayyub, after that is, uh, we mentioned Dhul Kifl, then Musa. Who comes with Musa? His brother, Harun, mashallah. And we're almost in the end. After Harun, then comes, you almost Isa. But before Isa, before Isa, there's still a few prophets that are mentioned in the, no, you guys are very close, but it's Dawood, alayhi salam. Dawood and Sulaiman. These are uh, duels, right? Dawood is the father of Sulaiman. After Dawood and Sulaiman is Ilyas, that's a little harder, and Al-Yas'a, Ilyas and Al-Yas'a, these are two different prophets, Elias, and then Al-Yas'a is Elijah, and then finally we have the prophet that's swallowed by the whale, which prophet is this? Well, then Nuni, he's known as then Nun, but his name is Yunus, Jazakumullah khair, Yunus, or Jonah, after Yunus, who comes? We're getting close to Jesus now, who comes after Yunus? Zakaria, mashallah, on this side of the room, the brother knows all of it, mashallah. Zakaria, wa kafalaha Zakaria, he's taking care of Maryam. Maryam is the mother of Isa. But before Isa, who'd? Yahya, John. Zakaria is praying to Allah, similar miracle. Allah gives him a son, John, Yahya, John the Baptist, after many years, similar to Ibrahim alayhi salam. Then who comes after Yahya? Isa alayhi salam. And finally, guys, who is the final prophet? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So before we begin talking about the prophet, yes, you have a question already? Yes, please. Of course, Isa is before. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, khatam al-anbiya wal mursaleen. He is the final prophet. He's the final prophet. Meaning, right before him was Isa, about 400, 500 years between the two prophets. Wallahu a'lam. So before we, ta we talk about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we have to see the setting in which Rasulullah was born. Everybody knows Rasulullah was born where? In Mecca. But what was happening around Mecca at the time? There was two superpowers, two superpowers. The, Furs, the Persians, the Persians at the time, they controlled a lot of what is modern day Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan. That was the Persia, right? And all the way into India. And then you had the, the Romans, or better known at the time as the Byzantines. They controlled that area of Syria, Egypt, that, that part of the world, into Europe. And if, for those who know geography, so you have this part is Persia, this part is uh, Byzantine, or Roman Greek. And south is what? The Arabian Peninsula. 
So a couple years before the birth of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, a man by the name of Alexander the Great, he went from Greek, and some people they, they think Alexander the Great, according to some of the scholars, they consider him, wallahu a'lam, I'm just sharing some opinions, as Dhul Qarnayn. So what he did, years before Rasulullah, he took the world from Greek all the way, and he used to wear two horns, so I studied the history of him, and it turned out to be exact. He took all the way from Greek, all the way, and he lost in Afghanistan. Afghanistan people never survived there. When he was passing Arabia, he asked his map artist, Herodotus at the time, what is over there? Because he had with him Socrates, he had with him great minds. So he asks him, um, what is down there? He says, it's a land with no water. A land, just desert. So what does he say? I don't want it. So nobody cares about this place. We have to talk about where Rasulullah is born. He's born in a place, it's a desert. Nobody wants it. The Romans don't want it. The Persians don't want it. They leave it alone because there's nothing there, right? Over there in the, in the north, the Euphrates River, the Tigris River, the Caspian Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, all of these lands. But in Arabia, there's a small well, a Zamzam well, that we have there that came from Allah, and that's it. So what he does before he dies, you should read this in the history. Alexander the Great decides, you know what? At the end, when he catches everything, he catches Egypt. He captures, he captures all, almost all the land that they know. He decides, okay, you know what? Time to go where? To Arabia. Time to take over Arabia. Guess what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did to him? He took him one that, at that time. Because nobody's going to live forever. Right when he planned to take over Arabia, خلاص, his time was done. So this is what the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is born into a time where the Romans or Byzantines are in control and the Persians are in control. And there's a very big story where the Byzantines, they give power to this man. His name is Abraha. You guys know Abraha, right? Everyone knows the story. Abraha, he's hearing that there's, you know, the Kaaba is not, let me be honest, the Kaaba is not as big as this or as nice as this, right? You can't go inside the Kaaba. He's thinking, why is everybody going to this small stone brick and not coming to my palace? He was at the time commander of Ethiopia and he went to Yemen. And his name was Abraha al -Ash He had his nose was half cut because he was dueling, and he dueled, and he had his nose cut. So he was known as the one with the cut nose. And he decided, I'm going to build a big palace. He built a big castle, and he invited the people to the castle. Now, I know we're in the masjid, but this is history. So a man walked into his castle and did number two inside. Why? Just to tell him, this is how we feel about your castle. He became so angry that he got, and the guy that did it, he's Arabian from Quraysh. So he, he gathered an army of elephants, and he marched them. It was very difficult to get elephants in that part of the world. And he marched them all the way up to Mecca. And when he entered at this time, and this is the year the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is born, Amul Fil, because at that time they did not keep track of time the way we do. You say, when were you born? I was born in the flood. You know, they, have, they don't have a specific year. So Amul Fil is the year Rasulullah was born. This is the, 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 the year he's born. Abraha is coming in with his, with his army. Who is the, what is the name of, of the Prophet Muhammad's grandfather? Anybody want to know? Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib at the time is the grandfather of who? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abdul Muttalib made a dua when he was younger. And then he had a dream. He saw in his dream. Because at the time, Quraysh was the Jurhum tribe. They covered the well of Zamzam. They covered it. Because they'd, they were fighting and they covered it. Many years passed. And Abdul Muttalib had a dream that he knows exactly where Zamzam water is. He went to Zamzam, he, he dug it up, he had one son at the time. And when he dug it up, everybody came to take the water. And so he made dua, Ya Allah, if you give me ten sons, I will give you one of them. And you might be wondering, how does he know about Allah before Rasulullah? At this time, Rasulullah's father's name is what, everybody? Abdullah. So they worship Allah, but they worship Allah and Uzza and all of these other gods. They're polytheists. They worship Allah, but they worship other gods with Allah which is haram, shirk. So he, he prays to Allah, if you give me ten children, I will sacrifice one of them for you. And what happens? He gets ten boys. He wants ten boys, specifically. At this time in Quraysh, they love boys. Al-Walid, what does Walid mean? One who has boys. Khalid ibn al-Walid. Walad, they want Walad. Why? Because the boys would help defend in the army with their dad. So at this time, billah, if they had a girl, they would bury her. They would bury the girl in the dirt, alive. This is ho how horrible this place was. So sometimes there would be people that would buy the daughter and say, don't, don't bury her, I'll buy her. Rabu Abbaq al-Siddiq, he did this many times. 
Umar al-Khattab, he buried one of his daughters. So at this time, they only liked boys. So he had, Allah blessed him with ten boys. And so he has to fulfill his, his, his word. The Arabs, if they say a word, there doesn't need to be contract, no papers, no cameras. If they say a word, they do it. This is why Allah chose them. Because they're very particular about words. And so what does he do? He decides to put all of their names in a basket and picks out their name. Whose name does he pick? Anyone want to take a guess? Abdullah, his favorite one. His favorite one, the baby. Abdullah. So what does he do? He puts it back. He picks it again. Who does it come out to? Abdullah. We've seen this happen with Prophet Yunus. So what does he do? He does not want to kill his, his son. He does not want to do it. At this time, is before Islam. So he goes to a soothsayer, meaning someone who is going to do, like, protect him from, because when you make a qasam, if you make a, an oath, you have to stand by it. So he wants to find a way to, you know, expiate the oath. What does that mean? For example, if you miss one fast in Ramadan, you have to feed 60 hungry people, right? This expiates. So he was trying to find, how can I get forgiven for this? He goes to a woman who tells him, every time you pick the name Abdullah, you have to sacrifice a camel. He picked the name Abdullah over 10 times. Some say 100 times. He fed the entire city of Quraysh to, to save Abdullah. And we know if he, if he sacrificed Abdullah, where would Rasulullah Sallallahu have been? And so back to Abraha. Abdul Muttalib is the chief of Mecca. He has his boys, all of them. You know, we know that Rasulullah had many uncles. Abu ja Abu these were the bad people were his uncles. Abu Talib, Abu Jabal, Abu, Abu Lab, all of these people were his family. And so he said to Abraha, Abraha comes to him, he says, any last words before I destroy your city? You know what Abdul Muttalib told him? He said, one of your soldiers, they took my horses and my camels. Please return them. And Abraha said, I'm going to destroy your, your, this, your house. And you know what Abdul Muttalib said? He said, this is not my house. This is Allah's house. He will protect it. Give me my property. <laughs> Give me my horses. And so Abraha is confused. What is this man? All of the people of Quraysh, they go up to a mountain. And they're watching. And everyone knows the story. Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashabil fil. Alam yaj'al kaydahum fi tadlil. Wa arsal alayhim tayran ababil. Drones, drones. Right? We have drones now, right? What do they look like? Birds. Allah sent drone shots on them. And he, he, he eliminated them. تَغْمِيهِمْ بِحِجَارَةٍ مِّن سِجِّيلٍ فَجَعَلَهُمْ كَعَصْفٍ مَأْكُولٍ And you know the surah connects to لِإِلَافِ قُرَيْشِ Why did Allah save them? لِإِلَافِ قُرَيْشِ The Quran connects. The reason Allah saved them is because أُلْفَتْ قُرَيْشِ Why? They had تَأْلِيف between them. They had love between them. They had this love of each other. They protected one another. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is born in this year. And when he was born, his mother saw a light that went all the way to Europe and back and all around the world. And he came so easily, they named him Muhammad. Ne never has anyone had this name. The one who is often praised from Hamd, from gratitude. When he was born, many of you know, his father died before he could even see his eyes. And his father died in Yathrib. At the time, Medina was called Yathrib. It had a different name. And there was a plague at the time. People got sick. So Rasulullah's father passed away. So at this time, if you have a mom and you don't have a dad, you're yatim. Obviously now, if you lose your mom, you're still yatim. So he was known as Yatim Mecca. Imagine, this is his nickname, Yatim Mecca. And at the time, there's a lot of wet nurses. They come all the way from the desert to take the baby. And they come and they check. The first thing they check, does this child have a father? Why? Because how are they going to get paid? The father pays the money for the child to be taken care of, like the nanny. So they come. One nanny, her name is Halima. Halima, her donkey is very slow. So she arrived very late. All of the babies with dads, khalas, they're taken. All that is left is baby with no dad. So she thinks, you know what? I'll take it. I didn't come this whole way for nothing. So she takes Rasulullah The moment she puts him in her hands, her donkey gets up and starts running. He's running so fast, he catches up to the other wet nurses. They say, Halima, what's going on? You just had a slow donkey. What's just going? And she's pointing at the baby. She knows what happened. She knows what she has in her heart. 
And she takes care of him for years. She even asks his mother, can I keep him a little more? Because all of her sheep begin producing milk. All of her crops begin having barakah. The barakah of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa And they used to send them into the desert to learn the Arabi lahja. If you read any of Halima Sa'diyah's uh, hadith, they're the most best, uh, the eloquent Arabic. And so Rasulullah stayed there. She wanted to keep him as long as she wanted until something happened. Many of you know this story. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may the peace and blessings be upon him, was playing with Halima had two boys, two young boys. She, he was playing with her son. And then this is described from the boys. They would never, the, the kids, they don't lie. What do they have to lie about? So they see something coming from the heavens. They lay Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam down. He's still a child. They open his chest. In, in the hadith, they put his heart in ice. This is a hadith from 1,400 plus years ago. Today, when they do open heart surgery, they take the heart, they put it in ice to slow it down. This is from the hadith. No one added this later. And so when they described, they took his heart, they put it in ice, they cleaned it, they put it back. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah removed from his heart anything evil, envy, harshness, anger. That's why he never had anything bad in him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they go back to their mom and they say, Mom, mom, somebody came and opened his heart and she sees. And they say, Rasulullah, he had a mark here the whole time. She sees. He never had the stitching. They stitched it back. He never had the stitching. What just happened? She returned him to, her, to his mom. Khala, she's, she's scared. She has two boys. What's going to happen to them? She returned him to the mom. Sorry, I can't keep him. Because this is too much for him. So the mother, Rasulullah's mother, she could not afford to keep him. And she passed away. At what age was, was Rasulullah? Six years old. Jazakallah. So when he's six years old, he lost his mom and his dad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we have to understand who this man was, right? If we want to follow him and love him, look at his story, how it starts. Like someone living in war zone. Who adopts him? The, the guy we talked about in the beginning. His grandfather, Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib loved Ras Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He loved him so much that he used to take him with him into the meeting in Darul Nadwa. So Abdul Muttalib, he's again, he's elite of Quraysh. So he, he's in the meeting. He used to let Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sit in his majlis area. No one else, even his children, cannot sit there. He's, he lets Rasulullah sit there. When does Abdul Muttalib die? Can anyone tell me? When the Prophet's how old? MashaAllah. Just two years. And Rasulullah goes then to who? Abu Talib. Who is his uncle? Abu Talib was a merchant. He used to travel. In the winter, he would travel. I believe in the uh, when the winter came, they would travel to Yemen. And when the summer came, they would travel to Syria. So he took Rasulullah with him. This is not Rasulullah's first job, by the way. Let me talk about his job. Rasulullah's first job was to grab the arrows in war. Because the, they used to go war. His job was to pick up the arrows. Very dangerous job. And you have to be brave. His second job, he was a shepherd. He used to, people used to give him the, the, the sheep. He used to watch the people's sheep. They come back, they give him some money for watching the sheep, and they go. The third job is with his uncle. So he's learning this, jo this job as he's going to um, Syria, to Dimashq at the time. He passes by a monk. Anyone know the monk's name? Because there's two monks we're going to talk about. The first one is, what is his name? Buhaira, Buhaira al-Rahib, from Bahar. Buhaira has watched, he's watching the caravan, and he sees a cloud following the caravan. So he runs outside. Usually the monk never leaves outside. And he says, come on, come inside, come inside. He knows something is, is in this plant. So Abdul, Abu Talib says to Rasulullah, stay by the horses and the camels. Stay by the, stay by the tree. He's the youngest one. Watch our stuff. We will go get water and food, and we will come. So they all go inside. Buhaira says, this is not everyone. And they say, this is everyone. We just have one small boy out there. He said, bring him, bring him inside. So he brings him inside. Buhaira asks Abu Talib, who is this young man? What does Abu Talib say? He's my son. Buhaira says, he's not your son. This is when they're like, oh, how does, this guy, we just met him. How does he know? He turns the prophet around to his back. What does he find? He finds a seal of prophecy on his back. He asks him some questions. He talks to him. He finds out he confirms. This is Rasulullah. He tries to give him a gift. He takes the gift. He tries to give him sadaqah. He says no. He, he's, he's practicing with him. He confirms 100% this man is the final messenger. You, the Jews, they're waiting for the final messenger, the Messiah. When Rasulullah came, he was the Messiah mentioned in their books. 
They denied him because he's Arab. They wanted someone from Ishaq. They're waiting for the Messiah. Their Messiah is the Dajjal. He will come, they will follow him. 40,000 Jews will follow the Dajjal. They were supposed to follow Prophet Muhammad He's the Messiah they're waiting for. But they, they, they refused him. And so this man, he said to him, take care of him. He never followed him, but he said, take care of him. Because he has a great future. Abu Talib takes him to Damascus and brings him down. The time progresses. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam begins to build a very, very good reputation. He begins to be known as two things. What is he known as two things, guys? What are they? Al-Sadiq and Al-Ameen. Sadiq means honest. Al-Ameen means trustworthy. Which means if I ask him a question, he'll answer honestly. If I give him my money to hold it, he will hold it. This is what he was, As-Sadiq Al-Ameen. He never cheated nobody. He never lied to nobody. He never stole from nobody. He was on the right path even before Islam. So what happened is one day, a big flood came and broke the Kaaba. And they asked, they, all of them, Quraysh, they wanted to put the Hajr al-Aswad. You know the Hajr al-Aswad? By the way, Hajr al-Aswad, a mystery. Wallah, it's a mystery. The Saudiya, they will not let anybody test it. But we can confirm it's not from this earth. Because the way that it glazed is a meteor. When a meteorite hits from the earth, we know that iron comes from, not from the earth. We know gold does not from come from the earth. It comes from, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed certain minerals and rocks on this earth. The Hajr al-Aswad, when Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam was working on the Kaaba, he received it, and it used to be abyad. And he put it into the, into the corner. Every single person in Mecca wanted to be the one to put this stone in the corner. So they fought each other. Rasulullah wasallam came, he brought a, something like this. He put the Hajj al-Aswad in the middle. He told them all to grab a piece, and they put it together. He solved the mystery. He made peace. He was known by everyone as a good person. Until one day, and we're going to skip the part. Obviously, he gets married. His, his honesty gets him a good wife. He works with, uh, with Khadija because he knows merchants. Fast forward to he's in the cave. When he's in the cave, suddenly something grabs him by the chest, squeezes him, and says, Iqra! And he says, Ma ana bi qari. I am not a reciter. And again, the angel squeezes him. Iqra! Ma ana bi qari. And there's two opinions. Some ulama say Rasulullah cannot read and cannot write. Other ulama say he can read. He can write, he was just telling the angel, I am not a qari. Like, what do you want me to read? And then the angel said, And he, he's hearing it, it's ringing. And he's, he's hearing, he's shaking. The last ayah. Two more ayahs. <laughs> he taught with the pen. He created man. He created him from a clock. <laughs> he teaches man what he does not know. So immediately he's scared, right? He's running away. He looks to the sky. He sees the angel wings. So many wings. He saw Jibreel in the, fi- in the form of Jibreel. He runs to his wife. Zamminuni, Zamminuni, cover me. He's shaking. He's scared. His wife covers him. He says, what's going on? He says, I got attacked by something scary. She says, wow, you are a good person. You feed the hungry. You give to the poor. You take care of the needy. You care for everyone. Nothing bad should happen. And he's not convinced. So she takes him where? This is monk number two. So we talked about Buhaira. Who's the next one? Waraqa ibn Nawfal. He was the cousin of Khadija. Some people say he was the first Muslim man. Khadija, obviously, first Muslim woman. Here's why we know that we, a lot of times we forget to mention Waraqa. He's the first Muslim. So Waraqa, he's blind, and he's old, very old, maybe 90-something. So he's also a monk. So he's listening to Rasulullah. He says, describe to me what you saw. And Rasulullah is describing in detail what he saw. Buh- uh, Waraqa says, you are a prophet, and these people will kick you out. And he said, if I was young, like, if I was young like you, I would be there to protect you, to defend you. And he passed away. He passed away before even the third year of, of Islam. But he believed in Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he told him, he said, they will kick you out. He said, Amukhrijini hum, they will kick me out. What did I do to them? He said, nobody came with what you came with, except they were kicked out. And again, we're doing a quick summary. So this is a very fast summary. As many of you know, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam got kicked out of Mecca. Can anyone tell me after how many years? How many years? 13 years. Allahu Akbar. 
13 years in Mecca, and where he gets kicked out. Those 13 years of Mecca were the most difficult years of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam's life. He lost Abu Talib. He lost his wife Sadida. It was known as the Am al Huzn, the year of sadness. In that year, even the Muslims they boycotted them. He sent he sent two two times he sent people to Ethiopia to protect them because they they need to be safe. So many people died. Ammar ibn Yasir, his mom died. He he became he had they put the spear to his to his neck and they said if you do not leave Islam we will kill you. He had to pretend to leave. Okay, I will leave. He went to Rasulullah. Ya Rasulullah, I told them I don't want to be Muslim so they don't kill me. He said it's okay. Rasulullah received the ayah. إِلَّا مَنْ أُكْرِهَا وَقَلْبُهُ مُطْمَئِنٌ بِالْإِيمَانِ That it is, as long as your heart is strong on faith, your safety is, is more important. For example, the ulama, they say, if you're in the desert and you have no food and there's pork, do you eat the pork or do you die? You have to eat the pork to survive. Because مَقَاسِدُ الشَّرِيعَةَ هِيَ خَمْسَةً وَمَقَاسِدُ الشَّرِيعَةَ And the, 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 the whole point of sharia is to protect your life, your family, your, your wealth, your lineage, and your deen. This is مَقَاسِدُ الشَّرِيعَةَ So, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 13 years in Mecca, no masjid ever built, no community ever c- constructed, people worshipping until the hijrah. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left Mecca, where did he go? Everybody knows this. He went to Medina. When he came to Medina, then sallallahu alayhi wa sallam built a masjid, then sallallahu alayhi wa sallam built a community, then he grew. It took 13 years to establish the foundation, and then how many years in, Me- in Medina, everybody? How many years? 10 years. Total of 23 years. In those 23 years of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam's life, the Quran was revealed. The Quran did not come one time, right? It was revealed in 23 years. When Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam migrated to Medina, then he began the wars: Ghazwat Badr, Ghazwat Uhud, uh, Ghazwat Khandaq. All of these battles they all happened when in Medina. When they were in Mecca, there was no battles. And so now, we, before we move on to the story. We have to understand these two phases, the Mecca phase and the Medina phase. The Mecca phase is all about what? Building inside. Building inside the Iman, the Ihsan, in here. Medina phase is what? Building outside. Sawm, Zakah, Hajj, Masjid. These things came when? In Medina. Mecca is all, there's no munafiqeen in Mecca, right? There's no hypocrites in Mecca. No verses came down about hypocrites in Mecca. Because everybody in Mecca was a believer. Right? They, you, they were believers. If you became Muslim, you, you got, your life was in danger. They were going to kill you. So if you're Muslim, you're Muslim because you want to be Muslim. In Medina, it was different. You have a question right here. We're going to get to, that's a really beautiful reminder from you, alhamdulillah. This is a very good reminder. So my brother said, what about Isra and Mi'raj, which happens in Rajab? When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lost his wife, Khadija, and he lost his uncle, Abu Talib, it was that year that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took him on the highest journey. In his lowest time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took him to the highest place. Subhan al-ladhi asra bi'abdihi layla. Subhan, the one who took his servants in the night. Min al-masjid al-harami ila al-masjid al-aqsa. The Qibla used to be where? Jerusalem. The Qibla was Masjid al-Aqsa. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, always in his heart, he wanted the Qibla where? In Mecca, the Kaaba. And the Qibla changed during the prayer. During the prayer. Imagine, there's a Masjid in Medina. It's called Masjid al-Qiblatayn. There's a Qibla here, and there's a Qibla over there. Right? If you went to Medina, you've seen it. Masjid al-Qiblatayn. Rasulullah was praying like this. In the middle of the prayer, he turned with all of his people, فَلَنُوَلِّيَنَّكَ قِبْلَةً تَرْضَاهَا In the middle of the prayer. So in that, in the Isra and Mi'raj, and thank you so much for reminding me, I was going to conclude with it, but we will go there. We receive the salah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, naimun fi firashihi. One of the few times he just lost his wife, so he's not even getting sleep, right? Before, every night he was with, he was with Khadija. Now, there's no more Khadija. So he's up at night, sad, sad. The Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam receives Jibreel. So Rasulullah is sleeping. This is a beautiful hadith. How does Jibreel wake him up? He takes his hands and he puts them on his feet. He touches the feet of Rasulullah. And they say that the malaika, they have cold touch. Cold touch. So Rasulullah wakes up gently. And then he, sa- he welcomes him outside. And some people say Rasulullah's chest was opened twice. This is the second time. He washed his chest again. He, he clarifies it. And he goes outside. There's a buraq. Even the buraq himself was chosen specifically 
for Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Burak came from a, a valley of Buraks. In, a Burak is like a, a Pegasus. A Pegasus. It's a horse that can travel with wings. You see pictures of it sometimes. And Allah knows best. He can create what he wants. There was a valley of Pegasuses in heaven. When the Malaika told them, one of you will be chosen to take the final prophet up here, one of the Burak stopped eating. He was so anxious. He was so nervous. Jazakallah khair. Barakallah feekum. Jazakallah khair. So one of the... One of the uh, Pegasuses was very anxious. And because he was so anxious, he stopped eating. When the angels came to check on this Pegasus, they said, what's going on? You're not acting normal. He said, when, I, when you told me that I would hold on my, uh, one of us would hold on their back, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu I can't stop thinking about you. And so he was chosen. And so Jibreel brought him down. Rasulullah was, was commanded to sit on the back of the Pegasus. The Pegasus took him in that night all the way. Now, if you get in an airplane today and you fly from Jeddah to Jerusalem, how long is it going to take? From Jeddah to Jerusalem. How, what did you say? Like one or two hours. Seriously. It's very close. It's very close. So today, if I tell you, you can go from Jeddah to Jerusalem and back in one night, would you believe me? Of course. But back then, they did not have this technology. So when Rasulullah came back, we'll get to that, they didn't believe him. He was taken from, Jeru- from, Jed- from Mecca from Mecca to Jerusalem. When he got there, if you go to Jerusalem today, the place where he tied the Burak is still there. It's still, they said this is where he tied the Burak. And he led all of the prophets in salah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created for him steps to go. One silver, one gold. One silver, one gold. And he, where did he, the Burak was, Tied right next to, now when we talk about Masjid al-Aqsa, people think Masjid al-Aqsa is the one with the gold dome. This is not Masjid al-Aqsa. Al- that exactly. Masjid al-Aqsa is a different masjid. It's close. It's, it's, it's what you can see it when you, where you are. Uh, and that masjid, the dome, I believe is like, it's not green, but it's like a kind of like grayish, bluish dome. Greenish dome. It's not fully green. But there's a small dome. That is Masjid al-Aqsa. So Rasulullah goes from there. Up to the heavens. He meets with prophets at every heaven. Every single heaven he meets a prophet. Until he gets to the final heaven. Jibreel stops. Even Rasulullah, you know how we are as Muslims, we we stop and say, you go first. No, you go first. (laughs) You go first. So Rasulullah stops. He says, Jibreel, you go. You go first. Al Yameen. And Jibreel says, I've never been there. (laughs) The lot tree. Jibreel said, I'm sorry, I'd never been there. So Rasulullah is confused, like, what do you mean? He says, you go. I, I have to stay here. That is the final heaven. Now we have two opinions. Some ulama say, he saw Allah with his eyes. He saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Other Opinion is, no, he did not see Allah. He saw light. One hadith. One hadith, one small mistake, and it changed the whole meaning. I'll explain it. An Abi Hurairah, radiallahu anhu, anhu qal, Noorun, inni arahu. Allah's light, I saw him. Wa an Aisha, Noorun, anna arahu. Light, how can I see him? So from the narration of Aisha, his wife, he did not see he just saw light. From the narration of Abu Hurairah, he saw Allah Azza wa In this ayah, Right? He saw, the ayah say, so if you believe he saw him, or if you believe he doesn't see him, both are good opinions in Ahlul Sunnah, for Jama'ah. No, no problem. No debate. We don't need to debate about it. Allah knows best. Because we don't know any other prophet that saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Musa spoke to Allah, right? But no one that we know of saw Allah Azza wa Jal. So in that moment, Allah Azza wa Jal commands Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with khamseen salah. Khamseen, 50 prayers. And what does Rasulullah say? Labbaik, Allahumma labbaik. Of course, I will go make my salah. He goes down. Who does he meet in the heaven? Musa alayhi salam. So Musa asks him, what happened? He said, I was commanded to pray 50 times. So Musa says, oh, <laughs> 50 times. Please go and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reduce the amount. So Rasulullah goes up. What does it get reduced to? 
45, mashallah, you guys know. And then he goes down, and it just continues and continues and continues until it is five salah. Then he comes down, and what does Musa alayhi salam say to five salah? Go back to sleep. Rasulullah says, I'm, I'm too shy. He's going down by five. If I go back again, it's going to go from five to zero. I need to pray. He wants to pray. And I will share with you guys one story before we continue this. You guys know uh, this man, his name was Cat Stevens. He, he became Muslim, and his name became Yusuf Islam. Yusuf Islam. You know, he, no, Yusuf Estes is another guy. Yusuf Islam, he, he, was, he used to be like a non-Muslim. He used to sing, and then he became Muslim. One time, he was traveling in the airport, and his flight was in like a couple minutes. And the people with him, they're running to the, to the flight. He stopped. He began, he said, I want to pray. They said, what do you mean? Go pray in the, in the, in the airplane. Yo, let's go. He said, no. I have to pray. I need to pray. I need to pray. He stopped everything. He made his salah. You know when you say, Allahu Akbar, and you put the whole world behind you. He made his salah. After he finished the tasneem, we thought we missed the flight. We find out, flight got delayed. Subhanallah. You see, when you put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala number one in your life, he, put, he makes the world work for you. The Kaaba, we go around the Kaaba, right? The Kaaba does not go around us. Islam is the Kaaba. We revolve around Islam. Not Islam has to work with my schedule, and you know, if it's not on my schedule, I'm not going to work, right? We revolve around it. So Rasulullah went back, he commanded his Sahaba to pray five times a day. The first salah is questionable. So, pop quiz for you guys. What's the first prayer? Everyone says Fajr. Can, can we get a, a correction on this? Jazakallah khair, sister. It is Maghrib. The reason it's Maghrib is because Maghrib begins what? The next day. In Islam, technically, today is Saturday. <laughs> Even the Jews, they practice this. Thursday night, Thursday night is actually what? Jumu'ah. So the first salah is what? Maghrib. The second salah is? Isha. The third salah is? There you go. حافظوا على الصلوات والصلاة الوسطى Protect the prayer and the middle prayer. The middle prayer is Fajr. Everyone always says, oh, it's, it's Asr, because they begin Fajr, Zuhur, and then they put Asr, Maghrib, Isha. Here, Salat al-Fajr. <laughs> the most important Salah in your day is Fajr. Because Fajr is the first battle against Shaitan. When you go to sleep, Shaitan, he ties three knots. One time, one time I was sleeping, I felt it. I know this sounds weird, I felt he was tying knots. He ties three knots. Why? To make you sleep harder. To make you sleep more. Then the alarm comes. The alarm. What does he do? Go back to sleep. Go back. You don't need to go. Just go back to sleep. And sometimes he wins, right? Sometimes he wins. But when you break the first knot, you say, Allah. The first, there's three knots. The first knot is broken when you say what? Allah's name. Alhamdulillah alladhi ahyana ba'dama amatana wa ilayhim nusur. If you mention Allah's name, the first uqdah, breaks. How do you break the second uqdah? Anybody tell me? Yes, Habib. Wudu, wudu, very important. I considered making this whole class on wudu. Re really, if we took that, I would have spent the whole time making one wudu. Obviously, don't take that time, but wudu, huwa nur, diya. When you make a proper wudu, you unhook the second one. And then what is the third one? Salatul Fajr. Now you defeat Shaitan. Now he's weak. For the rest of the day, he's weak. You beat him on the first battle. Now the second battle, Zuhr. Zuhr is silent, right? Silent prayer. Then Asr. Asr is, some ulama consider Asr the middle. So again, both opinions, no, no problem. Ikhtilaf hi rahma. It's okay. If you think Fajr and Asr are the middle prayer and you pray both, good for you. You know, when we talk about Laylatul Qadr, when is Laylatul Qadr? Who knows when Laylatul Qadr is? Allah knows. But truly Allah knows. Why? So we can treat every night in Ramadan like Laylatul Qadr. So we have to very carefully take care of our salah. And if you pray Salatul Fajr and Salatul Isha in the masjid, قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم كَأَنَّمَا قَامَ اللَّيْلَ كُلُّ If you pray in the masjid, Fajr and Isha and Jama'ah, it's equal to praying the whole night. Yes. Very interesting. What if you pray Isha without praying Fajr? That's a very qu a good question. I don't know if you would get half of the night. But I would suppose that you should try to do both. But if you make a mistake, you make up the prayer. If you miss the prayer, you make up the prayer. It's better than not doing it, right? Inshallah, we all do our prayer. So Rasulullah comes down. 
He goes back to Quraysh. He tells them. He says, I went to Masjid Al-Aqsa and they laugh at him. So Jibreel brings a picture. He describes exactly how it is. Abu Bakr, his friend, he, this is where he gets his name, as siddiq He believed him. The moment he heard it, he believed him. So when, now we'll fast forward to Medina. Before we conclude, because I see that we are already out of time. Medina, Medina to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is where Rasulullah is buried. He's buried there. There's three graves. Can anyone tell me who the three people are before we conclude? Who are they? Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Abu Bakr and Umar. Umar ibn al-Khattab, he actually took Aisha's spot. Aisha radiallahu anha, she was supposed to be buried right next to Rasulullah. Her spot was right next to Rasulullah. So if, if Umar ibn al-Khattab did not get assassinated, because Umar ibn al-Khattab, he was making salah, and some guy came, he stabbed him right here while he's praying. He killed him while he's praying. And so while he's dying, he asked Aisha, please, could you give me your spot, please? <laughs> she gave it to him. So that spot was Aisha's spot. Yes, Aisha radiallahu anha, his wife. So now she's buried with all of the wives in the Jannatul Baqiyah, which is very close to that area. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam fil Medina, we have many beautiful stories. I will just share two and we'll close off. One story is a Jewish man wanted to test the Prophet. He wanted to test him. And as many of you know, Rasulullah was not rich. So he sometimes had to borrow money. So he borrowed money one day from a Jewish man. And the Jews, they're notorious for lending money with interest. So he borrowed it under the condition, no interest. So this Jewish man said, okay, but he wanted to test him. He came the next day. He, g- he gave him the money yesterday. He came the next day. Where's my money? One day, in one day. You know, you're supposed to give months, two months, three months, maybe even a year. He says, where's my money? He's testing him. And you know what he did? He grabbed Rasulullah by the collar, and he turned him around like this. He didn't even gently, he was not gentle with him. He turned him around by the collar. The Sahaba said he, that Rasulullah had a burn mark right on his, because he turned him so fast. Imagine if someone did this to you, what would you do if someone did this to you? How would you react? Rasulullah took a deep breath. He saw his companions, they're taking their swords to come kill him. He said, no, stop, stop. What do you need? You want your money? Rasulullah, he didn't have the money right now. He told Uthman ibn Affan, Uthman, please give this man his money and give him more. And the Jewish man was confused. He said, I, I wanted to, to make the Prophet break character. I wanted to see him angry. I wanted to see him hit me. But no, Rasulullah forgave him. He gave him his money and more. Another story, just to show you who this man was. One time, a man came to the masjid and he, he, he used number one in the corner. Because at the time in the masjid was not carpet, it was, it was uh, dirt, it was sand. So the sahaba, they're running, yeah, stop him. What did Rasulullah say to him? Let him finish. Let him finish? Let him finish. Why? Because it's not healthy to stop someone from, from using when they started, right? No one does it. No one stop, starts and stops. He said, let him finish, let him finish. He let him finish. Then he went to him and said, you do not do that. <laughs> and the man was so embarrassed. He, he didn't do it on purpose. He was so embarrassed. Actually, I'm going to give you two more stories. One time he had a neighbor in Medina, every single morning he would throw thorns in front of his door. Every morning, every morning. So one morning he did not find thorns. So what did he do? He went and knocked on his door. He knocked on his door. He said, why are you coming? Are you coming to make fun of me? He said, I just want to make sure you're okay. You didn't throw garbage on my door. Another story. One time, there's uh, obviously you guys know that Rasulullah, when he came, he changed, he changed Quraysh. So the one grandmother, her grandson, he became Muslim. She never saw Rasulullah, and she never know, heard what Islam is. But you know what she's thinking? She's thinking, who is this guy named Muhammad who came and changed our, who changed our world? So one day, she's at the uh, market, and she's buying a lot of heavy things. And Rasulullah sees her have heavy things. He goes, Ya Ummi, let me help you, let me help you. He, he carries the, the rice on his back, and he's walking, and he's walking to her house. And she's saying, this Muhammad guy, if you see him, tell him I will, I will hit him. Tell him. And he's saying, well, what's going on? Why? He, he converted my grandson. He, he ruined this Quraysh. He threw it. So he's, he's listening. He is mom. He's listening. He, he, drops, he drops her things at the door. She says, my dear son, you're so kind. What's your name? He says, I'm Muhammad. <laughs> and she's like, oh, I'm so sorry. The character of the Muslim, this is the da'wah. And so I want to conclude with, we have to have passive da'wah more than active da'wah. Active da'wah is like, hey, knock, knock. Can you become a Muslim? Do you want to be Muslim? Take shahada. This is too forward. Passive da'wah is, when you are a good Muslim, and people wonder, why are you like this? And you say, because I'm Muslim. Why don't you, right, I've heard stories from young kids, when they're doing Ramadan, their friends are like, 
your mom and dad, they're not here. Eat something. Here, drink something. And the kid says, no, I'm not doing this because of my mom and my dad. I'm doing this because of Allah. And then the people say, subhanAllah, you, you're not doing it because of your mom and your dad? You starving yourself? You're starving and you're not drinking water? Not even water? This is what they always ask. Not even water? You know, we made a shirt of it now. Not even water. Because they always ask, really, not even water? Not even water. We will do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He gave us Islam. We hold on to it. So my dear brothers and sisters, we can talk for hours about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How he was a people. How he was, how he was with his wife. How he was with his, with his children. How he was with his sahaba. He said, khayrukum. خيركم لأهله وأنا خيركم لأهله. The best of you is the one that treats their wife and their kids and their family the best, and I am the best to my family. Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم never one time put his hands on a woman. Never one time. One time Umar ibn Khattab was walking by the house. Remember, Umar ibn Khattab, his daughter Hafsa married the Prophet. So he's walking by Rasulullah's house and he hears his daughter yelling at the Prophet. <laughs> he hears Hafsa raising her voice on the Prophet. So he barges in. And he slapped his daughter. Subhanallah. Right? Uh, it's his daughter, but still. And Rasulullah said, why did you, ha- you do that? He said, she raised her voice over you, Ya Rasulullah. He said, so what? I let, I let her. Rasulullah was the kindest, sweetest man to ever be on this planet. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how he, how he died, because we're going to conclude. He was actually poisoned. You know, he died at a very young age. He was only 63, 64, uh, depending on if you use the lunar calendar or the solar calendar. That's very young. People... You know, usually don't die naturally at that age, for the most part, unless they have a disease. So when he took over the tribe of uh, the Jewish tribe, a Jewish woman invited him to her house, and she did research. She found out which which part of the lamb Rasulullah loved to eat. It was the shoulder. So she injected poison into the food of Rasulullah, and when he ate with his companions, one of them died. One of them died. This is how bad the poison was. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he was suffering from that poison. Even when he passed away, he was using the miswak. His wife, she, she could smell the scent of the poison still in his body. Because poison takes time. It, des- it destroys your, your intestines, your insides. He was asked, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa by Angel Jibreel, do you want to leave or do you want to stay? He said, I want to meet my Lord. And I want to clarify one thing before we close the dua, that... من أحب لقاء الله أحب الله لقاءه. If you wish to meet your Lord, Allah will make wish to meet him. I mentioned something in the khutbah. One of the sisters came up to me and asked me to correct it. I said, if you forget Allah, He will forget you. Right? You guys remember that? Now let me clarify. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala He never forgets. Right? He's not forgetful. لا تأخذ الله لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض من الذي يشفع عنده إلا بإذنه يعلم ما بين أيديهم وما خلفهم ولا يحيطون بشيء من علمه إلا بما شاء وسع كرسيه السماوات والأرض ولا يؤده حفظهما وهو العلي العظيم vertical space horizontal space Allah knows everything but what I meant is when you ever meet people they don't know what their purpose in life is they say I don't know my purpose a lot of times, I, you know, because I've done imam work, how many times I have people come, say, I don't know my purpose. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm lost. This is how Allah makes you forget. He makes you forget why you are here. And if I ask you all the question, why are we here? All of you will answer the same. We're here to do what? Worship Allah. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ When you get up for Isha soon, I will read that Surah Zariyat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us, my dear brothers and sisters, for three things. And this is by uh, Raghib al-Asfahani. He said three things. The first is, عُبُودِيَّةِ وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ All of us, our purpose is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every breath, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, every breath should be about Allah as much as you can. See, we are human, we forget. Then he said, And the second purpose is to build something. Istimar. Build something. Whether you build your career, you build your family, you build a masjid, you build a hospital, you build a project. Istimar. You're here to build something good. And finally, the last purpose. Only to Muslims. Khilafa. Huwa alladhi ja'alakum khulafa al-ard. A khalifa 
my dear brothers and sisters, that we are Muslims, we are Khalifa. A Khalifa, the best definition I can give you of Khalifa is someone who other people that are not Muslims say, this is what it means to be human, the best human you can be. So I'll give you an example. Let's say all the Muslims, we do a picnic at the park, right? We do a picnic at the park. And then when we finish the picnic, we all leave and there's trash everywhere. So people, they see this and they say, I saw women with hijab, I see men with beard, they leave trash. This is how they are? Okay, this is not khilafa. A khalifa is someone who leads and shows how to be the best human being. One time I was at the ISMA convention in Chicago and I, one of my teachers, he t he, I, I thought he was going to make wudu. He said, hold my, my sobe. I held his sobe. He got on the floor. This is in the hotel in, the, in Chicago. He, wi he started wiping the toilets, the sinks. You know when we make wudu, we splash everywhere. He started, I said, Sheikh, what are you doing? What are you doing? They're like the janitors. Let the janitors clean because they have janitors. He said, I don't want even the janitors to come here and say, because this is what Muslims do. He was, he was cleaning the toilets, wiping the toilets so that when people that are non-Muslim, because this is the first time a lot of people, they see Muslims in one place in the, the convention center. And he says, I want to leave a good impact. So my dear brothers and sisters, your journey is through. You are Khalifa to us, Khalifa to us, meaning you are an example. If you're a Muslim, that means you should not succumb to peer pressure. Oh, my friends are doing this, I will go do this. No, a Khalifa follows the right path and people will follow you, inshallah. If you are confident in your deen, if you are confident in your Islam, you are proud to be Muslim, you will have no fear. How many times I was with my brother, we were playing basketball in the gym, and it's time to pray, and my friend says, right here, we're going to pray right here, in front of the people? They're going to look at us? They're going to think we're weird? Yes, right here. And after we pray, they say, we respect you so much, because you have a way, you have a purpose. Isti'mar, you have to build as Muslims. Alhamdulillah, we have people that are the most successful people are Muslims. And finally, ubudiyyah. And with that being said, we have just a few minutes. We ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala benefit us with the knowledge that we had. Oh Allah, we ask you that you grant everyone here wisdom and knowledge. Subhan rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Wa alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. And we open it up for any questions, if you guys have any questions before we, we make the, the adhan of Isa. Jazakumullah khair. With that being said, barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-azim. Wa nafa'ani wa